I cannot tell you how excited I am to be here. More than anything, I want to get to know you, get to know Haas with its unique culture. I joined here, as Richard said, a little over a year ago, oh, almost one and a half, and uh, I am just smitten by this place. I cannot imagine how I haven't been here before, how I spent so much time at another institution on the East Coast. It is a wonderful place. What makes this an incredible place, for me at least, is not just, you know, we have more knowledge Nobel prizes at the university and they keep coming then I think three uh, then most other institutions barring three and no in the top three is not one other institution you might imagine that exists in the Bay Area here <laughs> We also have, what, around 4,800 startups that have come up in the last 15 years compared to the 5,000 or so that are maybe down there. But we have more founders, which the latest data shows. You know, I guess we have more co-founders as a result, if the math makes sense or we counted it differently. But it's not even just that. And it's not even that we have more top three departments at the University of California at Berkeley than any other institution other than one, which is in Cambridge, Massachusetts, which doesn't have real technology going for it, you know? So it's, uh, they have a good business school, but still, you know, it's sort of, uh, it's not those things. Well, partly it is, but on top of it, I think what makes this so special is this commitment, this dedication towards a mission, towards society, towards having real impact. And I think that's what I've found so infectious on this campus. It may have started with civil rights movements and all these other things, and that's great. You know, I love that stuff. But technological revolution, thinking about all these problems, all of it's amazing. Haas saw that very early because something like a decade ago, these four leadership uh, principles were defined, and I can't wait to meet you all because you represent all of that. It's such a different way of thinking. You know, in developing this program, the Management Entrepreneurship and Technology Program, the MET program, I was so excited not just because we've got an amazing engineering school and an amazing, amazing business school here, but because I could define the mission together with my team as we create leaders who can combine technology and business to solve the world's most pressing challenges in a sustainable and scalable way. And that is unbelievable. Why? Because there was a program that I was a part of a long time ago as well at this other institution that I was at. It's 40 years old, and it's really the pioneer. And I will always respect it, being an alum, having taught in it, having led it, all those things. But all our kids would go off into banking and consulting. Nothing wrong with that, by the way. But that's all they did. And so I'm really excited to be here. I look forward to meeting you. As Richard said, we'll make and try and make this interactive, you know, so sometimes you can come up to the podium, sometimes not. I kind of cleared it with Dana as well. We want to keep the flow going. I know for the recording purposes, it's a little easier, but, you know, we want to keep the discussion going. So that's my preamble, but I'm really here to meet all of you and to get a sense of all of you and do this. So I'm really happy. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to do so. This work that you're going to see is actually brand new. So I haven't presented it before, um, which is both exciting, but at the same time, if it falls flat, then you know why. Um, but I'm, I'm excited because you're an audience that probably knows a lot about artificial intelligence or technology being in the Bay Area, at least some of you. Um, and so I hope there's something in it for everyone. What motivated this work was really to think about, you know, there are all these interesting technologies that are causing disruptions, but... They're being taught of, thought of in a very esoteric way or often written about in a very esoteric way. People get caught up in the technology and all the cool things it can do, particularly here. But what about the strategic and organizational aspects, right? What about, you know, how do I think about that if I'm a leader um, and I'm maybe not just on the technology side? So that's part of the motivation for exploring this. So this work was born actually at the other institution, but um, got completed here. And we, we wanted to do is we wanted to think about, so how do we think about strategic strategically deploying artificial intelligence. And the way we approach this work is not just to look at the leading tech companies, but rather I work with a whole bunch of different companies around the world, not just the big tech players here, but think about the State Bank of India, for example, big public sector institution. Think about Nissan in Japan. Think about Daimler. Think about Pfizer. Think about all kinds of companies across different industries, L'Oreal. Think about firms that are across different industries. How do they do it? Because they're thinking about it differently. And really what the work represents presents is thinking about, all right, here's the promise, here's the excitement, here's what we do, but it's not that easy to get your head around it. There are lots of challenges. What I really want to focus on 
um, is going to be these seven key pitfalls to avoid. That's what we learned from working with all these different companies. And then there's a little bit of a framework on how we can think about it. Some things will be a little elementary to you, but I think overall my goal is to provide you with a checklist, a little bit of a framework for how to think about these things, and that's how we can have a conversation. You know, and if you have a question, then you can, of course, always do this. In fact, I'm going to come down from here because being up here is sort of slightly uncomfortable. You know, I want to be closer, plus it's after lunch, you know, so I have to keep you interested and engaged as well. So, you know, everybody talks about artificial intelligence, and we've seen interesting applications, whether it's Siri, you know, Apple does that, whether it's our search engine that we use, which is Google, at least for most of us, and Google tries to figure out, or the search engine tries to figure out, what is this person really looking for? What are they thinking about? And so, you know, and they can't articulate, and that's really what they're trying to do, so that's very exciting. Alibaba has taken things in the big Chinese e-commerce platform one level further. If you interact with them in terms of, for instance, uh, customer service or complaint, they will gauge your emotions and build that in right away to offer the agents on the other side different kinds of solutions. So it's quite exciting and a bit scary to actually see that because you'll enable your camera and they will read your face and look at these different things, right? So there's a lot of promise that goes on here. And there's also something very interesting where people think about what can this technology do? Will it take over the world and all this? So I'll get to that in a minute as well. Now, before I go any further, I just want to poll you really quickly on, in terms of your organizations, where do you stand? It'll give you a good sense of where you are and where this group is. So there are really four options, and all you have to do is raise your hand. The first is, is your, so the question is, is your organization, quote unquote, in, you know, in parentheses, considering adopting AI in some way? It might be for internal reasons. It might be as a product offering or part of it. So A is, have not thought about it. B is, we've considered it, but decided not to go for it. C is, we are considering it, but we haven't gone forward with it yet. And D is, yes, we're in the process of implementation. So just a show of hands on this front, you, all the organizations that you're working for, um, how many of you are in A, you know, have not thought about it yet? <clears throat> Good, fair number in there. Okay, we always need a few. B, you've considered it, but decided not to do it. Ooh, that's actually quite interesting. Wow, this is great. C, considering it, but are undecided and haven't yet uh, implemented it. Lots of you, that's a great sweet spot. And then D, are in process of implementing it. As expected in this audience, you know, that would be the one which is the majority. All right. I want to engage a little bit with, um, I think you, you said that, considered it, but didn't adopt it. Sanjay, tell us. <clears throat> um, so the, my organization, our product, is going into a safety-critical application. Yeah. And I don't think we'd be able to pass any safety certifications required if we had baked in AI into the product. Interesting. And safety in what sense? Like medical sense or uh, automotive. something else? Automotive. Automotive. So certification, so the regulatory environment is, is sort of a little bit of a hindrance. Okay, interesting. Um, some of you have, well, many of you are in the undecided category, so that's obviously the sweet spot as well. And then others have done it. There are one or two who have uh, not thought about it, which is also interesting. Um, from someone in category D, you know, I just want to hear, there may be one hand somewhere, I can probably pretty much call on almost anybody, you know, and then uh, uh, what, are you, what are you doing with it right now? I want to get a sense of where that promise is. One person who just um, decided that, you know, raise your hand for, we're implementing it already. Anyone? Yes, please. Automating store ordering, right? So in what context? <laughs> Yeah. Excellent. Automation is one of the early fields, which is actually low-hanging fruit for many of us, right, to do this, which brings me to this next point, right? So well, this is, you know, my, I set up my slides in a more comprehensive way so that if we did a nice three-hour workshop, then we'd go through all these questions in detail. Obviously, you're getting a snippet here, but uh, the deck, if anybody's interested, is a bit more detailed. All right, so we'll come back to that in a minute, right? But across the board, there are a number of different areas where we see there are challenges in organizations when moving moving toward the deployment, and I'll come back to engaging with that point a little bit earlier. One has to do with the strategy. You know, many people are rushing into this thing, and they don't really know what they want to do with it. You know, I mean, what advantage exactly is it going to give us, right? I mean, is it really pointless to do it, or do we need to do this, right? And so this is the kind of thing we have to think about. So Spotify is one of my favorite examples, and I'll bring it up in a number of different ways. Spotify said, you know, there's so many, if you notice, Spotify's algorithm is much better at actually predicting what kind of 
music you might like. Either music that's new that you haven't been exposed to or music that's old and you forgot that you liked because you didn't choose it, right? So I asked them, well, how did you do it? You know, how did you come up with this? And they said, well, you know, we can boil the ocean. We can do so many things. All we did was we decided on these five different things we want to do and all our energy went into solving these particular pro, uh, problems that we have, right? In the shipping industry, I'm working with the shipping industry right now. In the shipping industry, they're just trying to solve this problem of how can we predict how long it will take for a ship to get a berth at the ports. I mean, if you really think about what's happening outside of Los Angeles, it's quite absurd because you don't know if the ship is going to be waiting outside for three weeks or for three days. Can you imagine if a plane flies to an airport like Heathrow? It's like, oh, we might land now. We might land in three weeks. We might land in three days. You know, So you can't have that, right? And so these are some of the ways in which they're thinking about it to predict it a lot better. Part of the problem, though, that we see is the leadership, right? I mean, they don't really have a vision for what the end state looks like. They're thinking about it more in terms of, all right, let's just deploy this shiny object, and I'll come back to it. And then, of course, budget is one thing. One big piece I'll emphasize is because of the program that I also am uh, the faculty director of is we need people to understand the technology, but also the business application. There are a lot of people, particularly in the Bay Area, they get the technology, they get excited about the technology, but not the business side. There are some other issues as well. Data, you need it continuously and it has to be of a good quality. Whatever you feed in is what you get out of the thing ultimately, right? The second is security. The problem there is a bit more nuanced than we might imagine. Your hackers are also using algorithms based on AI in order to try and crack the passwords, right? It's not that you're ahead in that sense, so that's the battle that we face. And then privacy is one thing. You know, passwords can be changed, but if my biometrics get compromised, that's my face. That's my, those are my eyes, and well, presumably at least, but you know, so maybe we can change that in the future too, but right now we can't, you know, and so if that gets compromised, then we've got a little bit of a problem, so we have to deal with it. More on this later. Now, I want to ask you one more time, just pull you briefly, which challenges, for those of you who are kind of considering it in particular and thinking about it, um, what are the challenges that you have run into so far? Is it technological, organizational, afraid of the negative financial impact, the regulatory side, or other issues? And I'm going to pull you again, just like I did earlier. So A, you know, is it technological changes that you're, challenges that you're running into? Cool. A small number, all right. Now, organizational, who runs into that? Okay, bunch of you, I like that. All right, the negative financial impact, who's afraid of that? A few of you, good. Regulatory uncertainty, yeah, I can see that, Sanjay, because that was what you were really alluding to in terms of certification, and anything else, you know, other issues. Sorry? Skynet, okay, so other kinds of things like that as well. All right, yeah, it can happen, it can happen. All right, organizational impediments, right? Did you comment on that one? Technology. technology sorry. To give us the technology challenge you're running into. Um, so my company is looking into AI uh, to automate some candidate recruitment. Yeah. Recruitment space, and part of that is the recruitment space. Yeah. So how can we make it easier for them to The algorithm is not yet where it needs to be, right? Yeah, it's not as sophisticated in figuring these things out, right? It's fascinating because I'm working with the Graduate Management Admissions Council. You know, the same uh, organization that makes the GMAT, and they have a monopoly. But, you know, test-taking and evaluating candidates is kind of primitive, you know, in that form. We could use so many other inputs by giving exercises, doing simulations, trying other things like that in order to do this. And so I'm trying to help them to come up with this, but we run into these features because you can't really consider those trade-offs. And you don't want something that's half and half because I can make a mistake, right? All right, organizational, I believe you had your hand up for that one, right? Yes. Uh, just, you know, Mark. Organization yeah. is just struggling to you know, modernize and transform digitally. Yeah. The thought of, you know, introducing or considering yeah. AI is just beyond the scope of what could be done. Yeah. Lots of different challenges on that front, right? I mean, it's not, you know, we have technologies, but organizationally, just getting people's head around it. Think about disruption in general. Forget AI. Any technology that we have, any disruption we have, the hardest part is not the technology. Somebody figures that out. But the hardest part is, after we have the technology, is how do I change? How do I respond? How do I react? How do I change my processes, my business models, and things like that? All right. Um, so we have to think about these issues, right? So... What AI cannot yet do is be a human. 
So I know there are all kinds of interesting things out there, like the Matrix, you know, where this thing takes over the world and does all these things. But we're not there yet. I mean, honestly, the algorithms are nowhere near there yet. There are elements where they might be, but a self-learning thing that learns how to do things that we do, manipulates us and all that, we're not there yet. But we tend to classify AI into strong AI and weak AI, one which is a little bit more general, right, and one which is narrow. Narrow, think about the example that we, uh, we had on stores, for example, right? So if I'm automating a process, then it's a very specific application. We consider that very, very narrow compared to something much more general where I want to engage with you as though you're a human and have a whole interaction um, with the other side. So that's what we think about. We're not at the matrix level yet. Don't be scared. Now, what are some of the interesting applications? What are some of the interesting pitfalls that we observe that companies do and that you have to watch out for? The first is thinking that, that robots will actually replace the humans rather than augment them. You know, and, and it's really interesting because a Japanese hotel in Nagasaki just ran the entire hotel on robots for a while. And, uh, you know, everything from check-in to afterwards, servicing, cleaning, whatever it is. And it's a novel experiment, but all kinds of problems started happening after a while, right? And guests were dissatisfied. We're not there yet. You know, at the Tokyo Olympics, you know, there was an attempt as well, though many people didn't really get to experience it. And I, I mention this because we, we can try and push the boundaries, and that's really important, but there are limitations to this. Why am I emphasizing, though, that humans are really important? If you follow the work of what IBM was, Watson did. So IBM Watson has been working in the medical space and trying to figure out what's the best algorithm uh, for diagnosing certain um, diseases. One thing that they did was everybody got excited a few years ago when their algorithm was able to diagnose glaucoma more accurately than the human could, you know, the, exp the, the physician who was in that space. What they forgot, though, and they didn't look at, and the media did not emphasize, is that if you added the human expertise together with the machine expertise, you got another order of magnitude improvement on that front, you know, and that is really, really powerful. That's how we can think about it. So I'd like us to think about this as an augmentation type of approach. And you know, the reason I mentioned all these companies in the in the um, industrial space, like the Boeing's and so forth, is if you look at their plants, this is what they're trying to do. The robot is doing something. The human then assists in trying to take care of some of these things. But many companies think, okay, this will replace what we do. It's not always like that. The second is we don't do a very good job of actually communicating what are the benefits that are coming out of this, right? And so we have to think about that piece as well from an organization point of view. So Domino's, yes, I'm using a pizza company, is actually very good at demonstrating to its employees, and this is the key in organizational change, right? Not just the people at the top, not just a few esoteric engineers who get excited by this stuff, but middle management and everybody else in actually sharing a regular, what they have is a dashboard dashboard showing how AI has improved their delivery times, how it's improved, how quickly they respond to customers, their management of resources, and they, by showing that, more and more people have been able to adopt it. As you can see, I'm headed towards the organizational elements here. The third pitfall, which is really interesting, is many people think of AI in very incremental ways rather than in the transformative way that we can. So for instance, in the clinical settings, we have a lot of people, you know, doctors used to capture a lot of information, notes and things like that, and then, you know, there were some mistakes in there. All that can be corrected, and basic processes can be done automatically, such as, oh, there's a mistake in the prescription, or we need to automate that process to get it out there. Those kinds of things are fine. The revolutionary opportunities are, oh, but you know what? I can now do surgery from afar, not just using a robot in a rural area, but I can do so because on just real time, it will suggest to me, the surgeon who has 15 years of experience, better ways of tackling that particular tumor. But if you start thinking like that, you have to transform the entire organization's processes. It's not just about automating the existing processes. We have to think much bigger than that. We have to think about all of a sudden, all right, if that's the vision, I have to have different talent. I have to have infrastructure set up differently. I have to organize it differently. I make money differently by having all these outputs. It's a completely different environment. And yet we find so many people thinking in very incremental ways. 
Number four is, again, where the, some of this stuff comes in, which is the shiniest algorithm. We tend to go after the shiniest algorithm and not aim for the impact. And I used a good example in this case, which is the, uh, the Spotify example. They focused very much. Now I'll use a little bit of this challenging example, and that's Lufthansa German Airlines, which I fly a lot, so it's a disclaimer there. But um, I like them in many ways. But they've been thinking about all kinds of processes which nobody uses. Like, for instance, in their uh, loyalty programs, there are a few things where they automate customer service, but that's not anything compared to the main customer service requirement. Or, for instance, you know, if you have an experience at check-in where you have a bad experience, let's say somebody took your seat, okay? Somebody took your seat for some reason, and you're very particular. If you're a frequent flyer, you always pick that seat on this particular aircraft because you know all those things, right? And so what happens in that case is there's no reason why that information should not be relayed somehow to the people on the plane so that they can be waiting for you with a glass of champagne as you board and say, you know, I, I know you had a bad experience and you can do that. Or proactively, I, everybody knows or should know by now, you know, on longer flights, I have a Bailey's on the rocks after the meal. That's just what I do. So I did, at least, when I could fly. But, you know, so, yeah, that's what I do. And by now, people should know that. But then they should think creatively. You know, like, I know you like Bailey's, but here's another suggestion. It's not the flight attendant who needs to do that. We can have an algorithm which figures these things out and say, you know, we have something new you might like in that spirit. I guess that's pun intended. In that spirit, we can do something else and do it. Why aren't you working on stuff like that instead of these boring things on the back end that nobody cares about, right? That's where I want to see it. ExxonMobil and others do this. Um, you know, actually, they're good examples of how you can use it to predict what's going on with their pipelines and offshore drilling, and that's a great example of these things. Number five, the value proposition, all right? When Homeland Security first got excited about um, AI, they decided, oh my God, this is so great. We can identify all kinds of people who are risky using our algorithm, right? And so they went after this. Um, and they did so in an interesting way. I think the value proposition wasn't bad. Um, in some sense, it was chaotic. It identified all kinds of wrong people, and there were many, pro and it missed a bunch of other people as well. It wasn't well implemented. The problem, what happened there, is that they thought about the value proposition in a very general sense. We can capture all the risk in that sense. Had they broken it down into, okay, where are our biggest pain points, and then worked on it in a bit more detail, they would have had a better job of doing these kinds of things. Bayer has a term for this. So Bayer in the pharma company, they call it pilot Titus, because you know it's a disease type of name, you know, and for pilots. But they do so many pilots across the board without knowing what it is. They spent over a billion dollars on AI, and there's not one application that's out there yet. You know, so just think about it. Don't boil the ocean. Pick like one thing that you can focus on and try and do it well, and manage the uncertainty that comes with it. Number six is a really important point that we are dealing with as a society, but look, irresponsible AI and the risks are very, very profound. If I have an algorithm which I feed with certain kind of information, uh, it has consequences. So, you know, there are some obvious things that we hear about in social media and other areas. I want to use a different example. IBM did a lot of work with, IB with Watson, this uh, AI tool, in terms of oncology. They fed so much information into it, they did so much. However, it came up with wrong treatment plans for cancer outside of the United States. And that was harmful. Why? The information that went in was of a certain type of demographic under a certain set of conditions, so it wasn't adapted to that, right? And so these are the things that we have to be cautious about where we have to make sure that we don't do that. Ethics plays one role, but to be frank, it's also about just the generalizability of these things. And then number seven is thinking that we have a bunch of data and then thinking about it as, all right, so that means that we can do anything with that data and we can do things. So think about Uber and Tesla. Um, they're good examples, but contrasting examples. Uber wanted to get into the... Um, the um, you know, autonomous car business. They're like, we have all kinds of data and we can do these things. But that attempt in that business, it wasn't that easy to translate that information to actually then build a car. Tesla did a much better job of it, but we really need to consider how will this translate. Big data is just data. We've been collecting it for a long time. Supermarkets have been collecting data on customers for decades on end. What do you do with that data? What do you feed the algorithm? What do you do? Those are the important pieces 
is, and the boundary conditions, right? So now I'm not going to criticize IBM. I'm going to say, all right, they understood some of this, and they've started working now with partners in order to fix it. So, for example, in diabetes management or in other areas, like they're doing with Medtronic, it's been very, very successful. All right, let me stop talking right now and just ask, have any of you experienced any of these things at any point in time, basically? And I don't need to go through all seven of them, but um, I just want to see a, a show of hands and then we can engage a little bit on that. You know what is there? And again, none of this is earth shattering, like I told you at the beginning, but it's a nice list to kind of check when you go through and do these things in an organization, particularly employees who are not as well versed with these things, right? You're all leaders in some form, you know? And so you have to think about it. So let's see some hands. You know, what have you run into? You know, take a hand in the back. You know, gentleman in the back. Go ahead. Yeah, great point. Yeah. Yeah. Can you give an example, for example, of one? It sounds also that the value proposition wasn't quite clear. The planning was not so good. Can you give us an example of that? Yeah, and in, in your estimation, was it that the value proposition for that application was not there, or was it that they just didn't know how to implement it properly? No, I think it was primarily the fact that uh, they did not have, a, you know, part of it, the vision, the understanding of that gap. In yeah. Time. But then the next piece is allowing time to experiment and come back with, hey, here's how we can actually benefit the end customer. Yeah. Yes. Where we did a couple of experiments, and once we go to the executives with, here is the plan for the experiment, they're like, no, 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 that's too many, too much change. Yeah. Excellent. That actually alludes beautifully to some of the things we're going to talk about after this, too, and I'm going to give you a framework for gauging readiness. You know, are you ready to actually employ? Any other, any other thoughts? Have you run into any of these things, anything, um, and share some examples here? Is that a hesitant hand, or yes, go ahead, you know? Yeah, and how do you deal with that when you uh, when you've run into the situation? How have you dealt with it? We're still working on it. To be honest. Yeah. 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 I like that because the safety angle also comes in. It good. So it's so, 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 in essence, actually, there was a lot to repeat, but just, um, but in essence, you know, in, um, you know, there are many circumstances where what we have, actually, you did a much better job. You know, give us the one, one sentence, you know, on that, and oh, yeah. I'll give you a mic, you know, so, yeah. <laughs> 
Thank you. Sorry, I didn't realize, you know. Uh, let me come around and bring it to you. A summary, you know, so yeah. <laughs> Not working? We thought we could do it, you know? Yeah. Where's our IT person? Is this one working? I think this is working, right? Is it better or is that just me? Stand with me. You know, so you, yeah, I'm mic'd, you know? So yeah. Okay, stand mic'd right here. You can use my mic, you know? So yeah, here, go ahead. Uh, sorry, which piece uh, do you want me to summarize? Summary, you know, so yeah. Uh, so we still we use AI quite a bit in our day-to-day -day application. So I work for a company that specializes in marketing campaign optimization and certain pieces of that. Um, you know, you're optimizing towards like a certain KPI, like a cost per acquisition, or um, you know, you want to ensure that your advertising is showing up in a brand-safe environment. And when you're trying to ingest millions of data points, right, and you're relying on an AI algorithm to help expedite that and automate a lot of those processes rather than have, like, a lot of human curation, um, the challenge with that is that based on the different types of modeling that you're working with or training data that you're putting into these different algorithms, you're not always going to land, especially for something like a brand safety model where it's, in many cases, people think of it in a very binary fashion. Is it safe or is it not unsafe? You don't always land at the same outcomes every single time because the inputs can be so varied and be really challenging in that respect. And so when you're speaking to non-technical audiences, especially when it comes to things like, you know, marketing and creative and contextual alignment, it's a scary thing to have to approach something that isn't, you know, you were thinking about it in a non-binary fashion. Like, I don't want to be the one who approved an ad that said, that showed up in a non-safe context, right? Like, that is a bad look for my company. But in, the, in reality, you're then missing out on a lot of opportunity to um, be speaking to people who are good prospects because it is, allows you to do so in a faster and more efficient way. And so rather than thinking about it in a binary yes or no, safe or unsafe, I've encouraged people to think about it rather than that, more, as, more in a spectrum, right? Like if you think about it for uh, entertainment, we have rating systems all the way from like G to PG, PG-13, up to R. And so if you're willing to um, say, I'm, I'm accepting a certain spectrum where I'm excluding 80%, 90% of unsafe content, that is an acceptable threshold for me rather than, can I get to 100%? No, maybe not, but I'm still doing a vastly better job than trying to think about it when you're only safe or unsafe. Does that? Yeah, it absolutely makes sense. And it sort of is, it gives us a sense, I mean, I think you've touched on many of these points, right? Including um, what we do, big data, translating it to AI ready, but also the notion of the nuances, which we sometimes lose with these things, right? It reminds me of another example. Netflix is something that everybody's talking about. What happened to Netflix all of a sudden? Netflix all of a sudden is like running into difficulty all the time. What happened? Their, their run rate was really good. This competition came, but they were so far ahead. So let me talk about the good thing about Netflix and how it used AI. Netflix was not just about streaming. That everybody was able to imitate. Netflix used AI to revolutionize product development in that industry. Historically in media, what would a studio do? A studio would say, here's an awesome director. I go and like create some kind of interesting show and then we'll see how it does. Netflix said, I have a whole bunch of data. Let me analyze all that data and let me predict what shows might work. And the way the, the, the algorithm comes up with something like, here are the five attributes that 10,000 people seem to like. Let's say ethnic characters, exotic locales, a little bit of romance, a little bit of mystery, and set in California, you know, something like that, right? Then what they do is they just go to the independent studios and they say, I want a show that has these five attributes. And guess what? It worked really well. That's why you have this proliferation of shows constantly coming. Because there will be at least 10,000, if not more people, to whom this speaks. Even if it's a B, it's not that good. Like, it's pretty good, but not really good. Because it speaks to a bunch of people. So that was what the contribution is that they made. Now, why are they struggling right now? Because a Disney or some of the others have figured out that, you know what? What if we can take the same type of approach with the data that we also have, 
but layer on top of it our expertise on the creative side of what has worked. Plus, we do things like add a brand and characters that people know, and boom. I get something which is much more powerful. That's the reason why people have jumped onto it. It's not just a simple explanation of, oh, Disney has X content, Hulu has X content. Hulu's been trying for years. That stuff is having impact now because they're combining this. And that's a beautiful example also of this human with AI interface. Now, Netflix has done really well because they started with, well, for those of us who are old enough to remember, they basically replaced Blockbuster, where we used to go to video rental stores, you know, and then what they did was by mail, you could get these. DVDs, you know, and that was the first stage. But then came the streaming stage. Then came the content stage. Where's the fourth stage? That's what we're waiting on. And then on top of it, they have some arguments inside too. So that's the other piece. But these are some of the examples. Great. Now, what this brings us to is um, the next piece, which is how do we figure out are we ready or not? And what's the right approach for us in tackling AI? Should we want to do something like this, right? So what I've worked on is, um, and I have to give credit to someone who I forgot to mention earlier, Pragna Kohli was a, a fabulous uh, associate director at this institute. I ran the Innovation Institute at uh, this other university. And so um, she did the work with me and, and she was really good about this too. But we have this, this two indices and it sounds cool because over here a function of so-and-so, but it's not that, you know. Uh, that fancy, but we've got a technology readiness index, the technological one, and organizational readiness index. And so what are the pieces that are important? Again, nothing earth shattering, but something useful to just think about before we get to the quadrants. You know, for the, for the uh, organizational side, uh, having an, an AI enabled culture is really important as well as integration of business and technology. And here's where I have found no better organization than Amazon. Amazon has metrics at all levels, individual, teams, across every single business unit on the deployment of AI in some way, whether it's more in the narrow sense that we were talking about, like automation, or it's really a, a product that we um, can actually is based on that, right? And it's something very simple, but this is something that they have, and you have to figure out, the, the simple check is that, all right, do my middle managers get this? As in, like, see the value and figure it out. If not, I'm not ready. The other piece, which is interesting that it came out in your example there on the health side as well, is having established customer relationships. This was the IBM Watson oncology mistake, not having the customers doing it as a lab, working, now they work with Medtronic, for example, in some areas, but having the customers where you pilot, where you experiment, where you do that is so critical, whether it's on the B2C side, but especially on the B2B side as well. There are different companies like this. There's another company that I'm doing a case on. It's called M Junction. So when I ask people, People, what's India's biggest e-commerce company? Those who know, they say something like Flipkart, Snapdeal, Amazon India, and all that stuff. I'm like, nah, nah, those are all peanuts. You know, imagine a company that does more transaction volume every day than all of those combined and has more profits than all of those combined. It's called M Junction. M Junction is a company which is the old metal junction, a joint venture between Tata Steel and the Steel Authority of India, which created B2B auctions, e-auctions. Initially, all their intent was to reduce certain um, problems of corruption um, when it came to procurement of coal and steel. They did that, developed something really unbelievable, and then they started working with their clients and saying, you know, we can do a little more, we can do a little more. They started with steel and coal. They started partnering with their customers to figure out what more can we do on the security side, on the predictive side, deploy AI, make these auctions even better. Then they went, use that. They went from industry to industry, whether it's tea, whether it's media. When you hear about the cricket broadcasting rights being auctioned, that's M Junction, that's the backbone, and that's several billion dollars. That's what I'm saying, it's much more. So their sophistication in using um, artificial intelligence or cybersecurity is far more advanced than what some of these consumer applications have, right? Now what they're doing is they're creating entire markets because they have so many different players, and all they're doing is they have the entire industry, in essence, across industries. So all they're doing is they're figuring out where are the connections, how do they interact, what can I do to create a vibrant market of goods and services within a particular industry. That's unbelievable. It would have never happened if they hadn't worked with their customers. And I'm going to double down on it because their expertise, I would say, is not even the algorithm. Their expertise is going into an industry, figuring out how the market really works, 
and then creating a solution for it. It's mind-boggling, the level at which they operate, and uh, very, very interesting. So um, that's what I'm working on. And it's based in Calcutta and not in Bangalore, you know? So it's a pride, moment of pride for me also. But anyway, so I come from that region, you know? So anyway, so this is an example of that. Now, technological readiness, that's fairly obvious. Availability of data, you have to have flows of data, quality data, all those good things. And the maturity of technology infrastructure that you have is important. But the enabling infrastructure and the technology is even more important. You know, on the medical side, we have so many possibilities to doing uh, well. But in Africa, for example, the internet infrastructure in order to do, say, image diagnostics, which we've gotten used to. You can have a radiologist sitting anywhere. The bottleneck has been the ability to actually send high-quality images, right? It's the same reason. Um, a couple of years ago, I was talking to the new CEO of Uber. He's not so new anymore. And he was like, why are we struggling in the emerging markets? And I said, have you seen your algorithm and your, your app? He's like, what do you mean? It's fancy. I'm like, who wants to, like, who has that bandwidth? Who wants to spend that money on the data with this fancy thing where this car is moving and all that? Give me a text message, you know, and send me this, right? I mean, it can't be more than that. But that's the kind of stuff that you have to think about when you're creating some of these solutions, right? So these are the examples. So who would be in these different quadrants, right? And what are the implications? The top right quadrant, if you have high organizational readiness on these fronts and technologically you're also pretty sound, what you have is this build and implement. You can do that, right? And I'm showing this because there's a mismatch sometimes between what, how ready you are or the enabling side and what you're trying to do. So all the tech companies, they have the advantage of being in that right quadrant. They can do it. However, JP Morgan is not quite in that category technologically and in terms of their fintech capabilities. Organizationally, not really there because most people still believe it's a relationship-based business, which is true. And so they tried to build an implement and it didn't work so well. You know, I would say the technological impediments were not as large. It was more the organizational acceptance of that type of advising where you've got, you know, especially on the wealth management side, but even on the trading side or investment banking, the reluctance is quite great to change that model. Where should they have gone, right? If you think about it, if you have low organizational readiness but high technological um, readiness, you're in quadrant number two, right? And you can think about that as how do I then, okay, I can do the technology maybe, but I can't figure out the organizational piece. There it's important to work with other parties to be able to figure that out, right? So, for instance... Um, Daimler is thinking about this. A lot of uh, companies like ABB on the industrial side, they're thinking about this. They're not ready, but they're like, what can we do? ThyssenKrupp Elevator, which produced the first elevator that's uh, no longer on ropes. So the first revolutionary innovation um, in 176 years. But now it has implement, uh, in, it, when you can basically work on maglev technology, what you can do is you can have these cars going in X, Y, and Z directions. So you can have the same elevator connecting different buildings and going vertically, horizontally, as well as on the other axis as well. It's mind-boggling. But it's hard for them to do this stuff on their own, right? Because their customers are very old-fashioned. They're not doing it. Partnering with a bunch of startups to come up with the solutions has been their approach. They bring, okay, we're TK Elevator, so we can actually go and guarantee you something that will work. That's been the challenge that they face. The other corner where you're organizationally ready, but you don't have the technology is something which often comes up too. Daimler finds itself in that uh, category because they were not able to keep up with the applications and the experience in terms of the user experience in the car. Whether it was predictive maintenance or it was things like how people interact and utilize the interface to just use their voice commands and everything else. So they partnered with NVIDIA as well as a bunch of other partners in order to make that happen. And that's been very, very fruitful in that organization as well. If you're in the low, low category, I kind of put wait for the right time. The real answer is you've got to build up those capabilities before you can actually get there. But you're not even in a position to actually partner with anybody. You have to get yourself to a certain place in terms of acceptance or in technology just to be able to do those things as well. So with that, the final thing I want to ask, and oh, actually there's one more example that I should mention here. I covered this stuff, which is actually Lego. Lego is fascinating because Lego was also in the category of they were unbelievably good 
at interacting with their customers and having a strong relationship um, on the organizational readiness side, they were very much there. Why? Because if you know about Lego's evolution, Lego used to be just the bricks, or they are the bricks that we build. But Lego ran into a lot of trouble over time. You know, they didn't make money on those bricks anymore. They were cheaper versions. So how did Lego turn itself around? You know, I, had a very, I was at the uh, World Economic Forum a few years ago, and the CEO of Lego came to the session that I moderated. So I asked him, you know, how did you manage this turnaround? of Lego, you know, from like losing money to all these cheap competitors. He's like, well, you know what we did? We outsourced the design work. Well, what do you mean? Well, you know, you can submit your design on the and, and go and put that on the website and do things like that, and then we'll figure out whether we want to actually, you know, make that or not, right? And I was like, you know, when I was six years old, there was no airplane, so I drew that together with my mom, wrote a letter to Denmark, to headquarters, and did all that. Now you can do that automatically. He's like, yeah, that's what we do. We outsource it. And then I'm like, but wait a minute, then what's, what is it that you actually do? You know, where's your competitive advantage if you don't even do the design of these things? He's like, oh, that's very simple. We make the instructions we figure out how to make the instructions easy. I'm like, oh my God, that's mind boggling. So I'm like, you also freed up a lot of resources then to do other stuff. He's like, it's not that we don't do any design, but we actually get the user interface so strong and we do that. So they had really strong capabilities on the organizational side because people were already doing it. They wanted to take this to the next level. They wanted to say, all right, what can we do with artificial intelligence in terms of helping people to come up with novel designs or helping them? That was one thing. So they built that in. So there's some users who can now, who are kind of, if you've submitted a certain number of designs and you do well, you have access to special tools. The same is also in the educational space and the lab space because Lego is used now to run very sophisticated experiments in scientific labs, you know? But if you have this capability, Lego gives you a another tool, which helps you by interacting with this algorithm to make even better designs. The other thing which I found awesome is they use artificial intelligence in order to come up with a whole solution on helping those who are blind actually come up with designs. You know, so that was with the help of AI because it required inputs of a different kind and tools of a different kind. Um, and they developed a Braille technology for their instructions based on that interaction as well. So that to me is like great and it fits with very much with Haas and Berkeley on the impact side too. So that's the other example. The real question here becomes yes please please go ahead. Sorry. If your organization is in the quadrant one yes. and you want to go to AA, what do you recommend? To build first the organization readiness or the technology? Yeah. It's a great question because I haven't put any weights behind these things, right? In essence, right? It's sort of there. So as far as I'm concerned, there are plenty of partners out there who can help you with the technology. In fact, they can do it better. In fact, this is what JP Morgan should have also uh, realized at some point um, on the technology side and not wasted time on that. They did build and implement, right? They were neither ready organizationally, uh, definitely not ready, and technologically they got somewhere. I would invest my money in figuring out the organization. And that means use cases. It means strategically, where is my value proposition? It means not trying to do everything, but one specific problem that you want to solve that you can't yet solve that's the kind of thing I would focus on. It's the Spotify approach, you know? One thing we want to do, make better predictions on music. That's all I want to do. Or I want elevators to be much more uh, maintained, much more better, and preemptively catch that, right? That's what you do. So my, what I have seen is there are partners to the technology side. The organization is much harder, especially if you have partners. Any other questions or thoughts? Yeah, go ahead. Just yeah. Yeah. What AI was in the past. Yes. How much is that limiting some of these? Yeah. Uh, people have this sense of, well, this is what AI is. Versus yeah. It's clear here, if you're talking about data, you're talking about algorithms. Yeah. It feels much more in the ML type space. But yeah. The education required, especially when you talk about organizational readiness. Yeah. You're absolutely right. I mean, what is AI is another question. In fact, there's a white paper which accompanies this whole thing. We have a whole glossary in there. Because what you're alluding to is very important. It's not like this is new, any of this. I mean, honestly, we have something called expert systems, which existed sometime in the 80s, which are trying to help you and assist you make decisions um, based on some information. We just didn't have the data. We didn't have the capability to process the data. For me, data to, um, you know, AI is the tool that we use to translate data into something actionable or decisions that we can 
can make, right? Now, we also have different approaches for this. If we use simple, you've heard the term predictive analytics, that's based on statistics, essentially. Machine learning is the alternative tool, and that's used, but it uses other technologies that machines use to learn a little bit more, right? So that's what people get excited about. But what you're saying is exactly correct. What is AI is a really important question. What tools are we using? What impact will it have is very, very basic, right? And the reason we have this is because engineers may know what they're talking about and they fall in love with it, but the rest of the organization doesn't. Frankly, that's why I study this too, because I had no idea, you know? But yes, the white paper will make available as well, so you can actually get that if you'd, if you'd like on that front as well. Any other thoughts? I'm kind of curious to hear on this front too. Um, where are your organization finds itself, you know, and, and, um, and any examples of that as well and anything you'd like to share. I'm kind of curious to hear this because a lot of people jump on the build and implement. They're like, oh, let me go and like hire a bunch of people who can do this and, and, uh, and we're not ready, you know, and, and we can't do that. So, um, so where are you on this or any other general questions you have, we can transition into this as well, you know, in the remaining 10 minutes or so that we have. Yes, please. Yeah. And we build an implement for people in the other three quadrants. Yeah. And the difficulty I face is we're unlocking something that's so exponentially valuable and they're treating it like a software license. Yeah. That's the incremental versus the radical piece. And how, how do you, <laughs> number one, make sure that you can help them see that vision. Yeah. Um, and number two, how do you demonstrate that and actually capture that value yourself when you're not going to? Yeah. This is a great question, and I have a, an example on this as well. So when, um, you know, ABB is this big industrial company. It used to be known as Asia Brown Bavari, um, Scandinavian Swiss company, and they do a lot of um, energy equipment, turbines and things like that as well, right? So when they went there with their customers, the original version was exactly something like that. They said, oh, give us predictive maintenance because we run power plants based on your equipment and all these things, and we don't want that to go wrong. We want that to work properly, right? So that's what happened there. But the way we worked, actually I worked with them on this, is that let's now think about how you can solve your customers' problems. And it was actually very simple because they had so much data not from the actual usage of this equipment, which also suggested energy use and patterns of this sort. So then the next time that they went and said, you know, we can help you with the maintenance, but actually, did you realize that? There's a consulting element to it. So we added a service organization to it, where basically it's like, I solve my customers' problems with this, right? I have all the data for that, right? That's how we approached it. Now, it wasn't so easy internally, because people were used to making the machine, um, and they did that. That was the other problem they faced. But that could be bridged in terms of of once you see one lead customer who does this and you make a lot more money on it, it's there. Another example I'll use is telecom. In telecom, we had you must own your network. And the suppliers, like the Siemenses back then, or the Ericsons or the Nokias, they just gave you equipment, right? And then it was up to AT&T or Vodafone to use it. Bharti Airtel came, which is the number one, number five right now in the world in terms of mobile Indian player. They didn't have the deep pockets required to compete with the state-owned enterprise in India, nor with the Tata and Reliance groups, which had billions of dollars to invest in this. So they outsourced the network. And they said that, you know, IBM, you make software for the billing. You know, Ericsson and Nokia, you guys give us the equipment. How about you guys build the network? How guys, you guys, how about you run the network, and then we pay you based on how much we make off of these customers? Now that required, you know, Ericsson and IBM and everybody else, Nokia, to step up their services. But they tried it once with Bharti, and it worked well for them. So now they have a whole new business out of it, right? Both sides win in that. So that's the transition you have to do. But it doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen overnight. There's actually a delicate tension between big vision, but then specific problem we're trying to solve. So you have to really do that. It's a great question. Any other questions, thoughts, examples? Anything that's been triggered? No? Yes. Extreme in which direction? Quadrant one or quadrant four? Actually, we are extreme in quadrant four. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Otherwise, 
why we had run into this mindset where even something that is maybe common sense yeah. becomes an AI or yeah, where well, you don't need it. It's the same with blockchain. You know, you don't need blockchain everywhere. You need it where your current ERP systems, your enterprise resource systems don't work. Otherwise, it might be expensive. And, and that's the thing, you know, using it everywhere. It's actually a very nice example. Um, so, you know, there's an example which fits with this, but also connects nicely to the other point as well. So I've been doing work with Pfizer um, during the pandemic, and that's one of the companies that I had mentioned. And as you know, um, Pfizer, together with BioNTech, came up with um, one of the major vaccines that we use, and they did so in record time. And everybody talks about how it's because a lot of money was poured into it. That's only one part of the story. The real part of the story is that they finally started using artificial intelligence to predict the impact of certain compounds, as opposed to testing every little piece. Why is that important? If you think about an airplane, Boeing, Airbus, and the like, they stopped a long time ago testing every single component physically. They do it for subsystems, because the stuff has to fly, right? But they started using simulation decades ago in order to predict the flow. Now, physics in that sense is a little bit better defined than the human body and all the factors that could go wrong. But the point I'm making is AI was instrumental in changing the entire product development approach. COVID-19 was a test case for that. And what was so powerful is now we can use that approach in order to shorten the time. When I'm with doctors um, and with people from pharma industry, I provoke the heck out of them. I always start with something like, do you know what a smartphone is? <laughs> They're like, of course. Like, what if you never had smartphones and you only had fancy landlines with like a screen or something? I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm like, we still use, we still use radiation and chemotherapy as the primary means of cancer treatment even today. And all we've been able to do is, for me, it's not satisfying that we can tell people, hey, your chances of surviving five years is 80% now. Five years from six months? I know it's an improvement. I don't want to joke about that. But my point is, we have made incremental progress on that front. I get that it's hard, but let's do something else. So they're saying, what can we do? I said, let's change. The problem is not your product. The problem is not your business model. Well, actually, that is a problem. But the problem is your process for doing innovation. That's the issue. We use combinatorial chemistry. Decades down the road, brute force approach of, oh, I think this flower works. I think that plant works. Let's try all these different combinations and see how it works. I mean, it's improved incrementally, but not fundamentally. But these kinds of approaches, why I was so excited, the predictive approach, finally. And now, of course, that they've seen it, they're going to do it. And GSK is going to do it. And everybody else is going to do it. So that's the exciting stuff that we can do. Great stuff. Yes, ma'am. Please, go ahead. I know if you're soft spoken versus you know this, then thank you. I'm not, so I'm always you know. Yeah. Okay, it works. So um, I work in the software industry, and we yes. make software for the life sciences, the pharmaceutical companies. What you said is true. There was there hasn't been significant innovation, and one of the challenges, as you pointed earlier, is because it's regulatory industry, highly regulated industry, and most of the health authorities, whether it's FDA or Emma, or whichever industry, uh, whichever authority it is, they require these companies to do those experimentation. Even the clinical trials, you cannot yes. just say, I simulated clinical trials. So I think, in my personal opinion, COVID has actually changed the shift in mindset for these pharmaceutical companies and also the health authorities. So yes. I, I wouldn't think that they did not think about it, not to simulate, but that is not proof enough to actually produce... Uh, no, that's right. Um, the In particular, the clinical trial piece is actually the bottleneck, you know, because of the way we have to do it. And there are good reasons to do it. The beauty of it is now we also generated a ton of data right away, you know, just by everybody doing this and using the vaccine and so forth as well. So absolutely right. So that's why I had regulatory as one of the factors which also fits in. Banking has that problem. You know, I was on the other day arguing with my, uh, with this, um, uh, my, this trading, this uh, wealth advisor, just because he has to put in certain trades. And I said, you know, I, how can it be that I can only trade between like 9 a.m. and 4? 
I'm busy during that time. I want to do it in the evening and on the morning. And then, you know, I said to him, how can I not do it like instantaneously? It's taking time. What if in the morning I want to get an IPO and I want to dump it by the end of the day? What is this, you know? And he said, oh, we can't do it regulation. I'm like, forget all that. Nothing has changed in the last 50 years in that industry other than I can sit and do it from my room in terms of the internet, right? Rather than other things, right? Now I'm playing with, you know, I'm running a natural experiment with a robo-advisor and my Morgan Stanley advisor, and I will see, and it's the same portfolio I've constructed, actually, with both of them, um, with wealth, wealth Front, I think, and then I'm seeing, all well, roughly the same, but I have a little thing, and I'm seeing which one does better, you know? So that'll be my proof point of all this. Anyway, I know we're a minute away. The final thing I want to say is ultimately I want to bring it back. I want to bring it back and say that ultimately for me, disruptions and changes in technology, revolutionary technology, that's all great. But ultimately, what we have to do is, it's not about the technology. We have to align the strategy in the organization. If those things are aligned, then we have good progress and we can revolutionize the world, but we can also change ourselves and adapt. If they're misaligned, then we can't do it. We can't only have the strategy and the business model. We can't only have the technology. We can't only have the organization. These three need to work in concert. Oftentimes, it's not the technology that's the problem. Somebody knows the technology out there. It's the strategy and the organization. So with that, thank you very much, and this is me. <laughs>